Welcome everybody to lecture two for week one and in this particular lecture we're going to dive into Krauss's explanation for the change in the arms transfer and production system. As the idiom goes, to know your future you must know your past. You may have thought to yourself that this class was going to spend a lot of time looking at contemporary arms transfers. If you thought that, I'm sorry to burst your bubble, and please don't rage in the discussion section. We aren't exactly going to dive into that quite yet. The reason for that is I firmly believe that understanding the evolution of the arms trade and production system is incredibly valuable and pivotal in understanding why we're here today. It allows us to understand who the major actors were in the past, why they changed, and what effect that change had on the international state system. And then, after identifying all of that, we can start to infer patterns of change. Even more interesting, the story of the birth of the modern arms trade and production system and the story of the birth of the modern state go almost hand in hand, to the point where you may not fully understand or know where which one began and the other ended, kind of like the chicken and the egg. It'll make more sense to you once you've done the readings. In his book, Keith Krauss explains that he believes that three pursuits generated the demand for production in the trade of arms, especially in the modern era, and that was the pursuit of wealth, the pursuit of power, and the pursuit of victory. And we're going to go over each one of those independently. Krauss explains that in a state's pursuit for wealth, the establishment of a domestic defense industry is a byproduct of industrial processes that require adequate economic infrastructure to be in place. This would mean that the focal points of the arms trade and production system should also mirror the major industrial centers of any given period. And if you think about it, this makes sense. In order to be able to produce arms, usually your state has to be advanced enough industrially to even have a chance to produce those arms. Krauss goes on to further explain that while the pursuit of wealth provides the environment for the arms trade and production to occur, it is the state's pursuit of power that was the quote-unquote primary driving force behind the large-scale production of arms, which was precipitated by the existence of the state in potentially conflictive relationships operating under the security dilemma and self-help system. To put it in an easier-to-understand vernacular, States exist in an anarchic system where nobody guarantees their security but themselves. So they decide to invest in the production of arms to defend themselves and increase their own power relative to others within the state system. Because power is security. However, not all states have the ability to produce arms due to the uneven distribution of economic, social, and technological capabilities. So states that are unable to produce will look to import, hence the development or the evolution of the arms trade itself. States will always look to produce first and import second. It must be noted that the pursuit of power would also predict that any changes in the structure of the arms trade and production system ought to mirror the changes in the international state system as a whole. Lastly, the pursuit of victory is explained by Krauss as providing the stimulus to arms transfers, arms production, and military innovation. A state will consistently look for an advantage on the battlefield to ensure its security. Therefore, it will produce arms and look to innovate those arms in an attempt to gain more power and security in the international state system. Innovation that produces a military good that provides more power than existing weapons would mean that the producing state would likely move up the hierarchy in the international state system and increase its own security relative to other states. Think of the U.S. and the Soviet Union after the invention of the atomic bomb. Overnight, both the U.S. and the USSR were the two undisputed superpowers within the international state hierarchy. To sum up, in a nutshell, Krauss is saying that, that the pursuit of wealth explains the development of the environment for the production of arms to take place. And the pursuit of victory explains why states would accumulate arms. And the pursuit of victory explains why military innovation occurs and changes the hierarchy of states within the international state system. So now that we understand the impetus for development, accumulation, and change of the arms trade and production system, let's dive into the mechanisms specific to systemic change. 
Krauss asserts that innovation in the arms trade and production system is largely incremental, meaning that it doesn't usually occur that quickly. Change is largely a result of states attempting to keep an increased power in the international state system. They do this by producing the means to protect themselves, arms, right? Now, slowly over time, arms are diffused, or the technology to produce those arms are diffused around the modern world, each country acquiring arms through trade or production, one or the other. Eventually, innovation and technical diffusion together, working together, result in systemic change. Speaking of change, Krauss identifies four periods of massive systemic change to the arms production and transfer system, in which the introduction of new forms of military arms results in what they call, or what Krauss calls, a military technical revolution that not only changed the international state hierarchy, but also changed the major players, producers, importers, in the arms trade and production system itself. The four military technical revolutions identified by Krauss are, one, the gunpowder rev revolution, two, the industrial revolution, three, the mobility revolution, and lastly, the nuclear revolution. Krauss suggests that since we are looking at these revolutions at the systemic level of analysis, then we should be able to identify the primary producers, patterns of trade, but also how diffusion and innovation takes place, which would lead us to understand how the next military rev rev revolution precipitated and occurred. The first military technical revolution that we're going to review is called the Gunpowder Revolution. This is the first revolution that precipitated what we refer to as the modern arms trade and production system. To understand how this revolution shaped the aforementioned system, we also have to understand how it affected the creation of the state itself. That's exactly what we're going to be doing in the next lecture.